our panel today really is a distinguished cross-section of government service, the military, the legislative branch. Um, so all of the constituent parts of this important national security debate are represented. Uh, let me introduce them quickly before we begin the presentation. Um, the, Honorable Jeff, the Honorable Jeff Sessions, U.S. Senator from Alabama, clearly a leader of the defense policy debate on Capitol Hill. Uh, next to him, the Honorable Robert Hale, Under Secretary of Defense. We call him the Comptroller. And I interviewed Secretary Hagel recently, and he confided in me that he refers to his Comptroller as Happy Hale. And perhaps we can find out why happy as opposed to, to hopeful. Uh, next to him is General Michael Hostage, Commander of the Air Combat Command. Sir, thanks for taking time off from your mission to join us here today. Uh, next is the Honorable Dove Zockheim, who today is Senior Advisor for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, also a former Comptroller, and it gives me great pride as a father, I know Dove will appreciate this, that Dove is actually only the second smartest Zakheim that I know. <laughs> uh, next to him is the Honorable Michelle Flournoy, a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Uh, in my Rolodex, I look under QDR, and Michelle's is the first name there. And on the end, of course, um, is the Honorable John Lehman, chairman of JF Lehman and Company, former Secretary of the Navy, and how fitting to have Secretary Lehman joining us here at the Reagan li Library, because, sir, your legacy lasts to this day. So thank you all for joining us. And to set the stage, to prepare the battlefield for ideas, I invite each of our panelists to share some thoughts. Senator. Tom, thank you, and I'll try to be succinct. I'm a ranking Republican on the Budget Committee and a senior member of the Armed Services Committee, so you know I feel the tension that we're uh, wrestling with today. I'll just share a few thoughts. Uh, the Budget Control Act, which the sequester was a part, was passed in August of 2011. It promised to reduce spending by $2.1 trillion over 10 years and promised the American people that we, if we could raise the debt ceiling $2.1 trillion, we would reduce spending over 10 years. Many said we would not stick to that. Uh, so far, pretty much have st stuck to it. But whether we will remain or not, I don't know. The Defense Department, out of all spending, uh, took half the cuts. It's one-sixth of the federal budget it took half the cuts. It will receive substantially more reductions than any other department, without doubt. The uh, non-defense discretionary that took other cuts, for every $100 they reduced their spending, they got $20 billion from, or uh, $10 from the, from the uh, uh, entitlement reductions of Medicare. Uh, but at any rate, so here we are uh, at a time where the cuts are falling dramatically. This year, the Defense Department will take another $20 billion reduction in spending. After this year, it's supposed to grow at 2.5% a year. Uh, the non-defense has already taken a little more cuts early. They are flat this year, and then they will grow at 2.5% a year. But the problem is, I see it, the fundamental challenge is these reductions of spending on the Defense Department are falling too fast, too hard, and it's not possible to achieve the savings so quickly without doing substantial damage. And that's where we need to work on that. I've got some ideas, and hopefully we can. I'll stop and Thanks, let sir. us move on. Mr. Hale. So it won't come as any surprise to you when I tell you we've had enormous uncertainty, unprecedented in the four, nearly 40 years and I've been involved in the defense budget. Five shutdown planning drills. We've done two six-month continuing resolution. We're under another one now, sequestration last year, of course, the 16-day government shutdown. And it has done serious damage to this military. Our readiness has been degraded. We have hurt both the morale and I would argue the productivity of our civilian workforce. I think there are several things we need to do, but by far the most important is we desperately need some reasonable budget stability for several years in the Department of Defense. And we need to avoid the abrupt cuts that would occur uh, if we continue uh, with, the, uh, with no change in the Budget Control Act. We also need courage. Uh, in the Pentagon, we need the courage to do things to stretch defense dollars. That would include cutting back on management headquarters, that would include coming up with specifics to continue to slow the growth in military pay and allowances and many others. And we need courage on the part of the United States Congress 
to let us slow growth in military compensation, to let us get rid of unneeded infrastructure, and let us come up with a balanced reduction in forces to include uh, some reductions in guard and reserve. And finally, we need a balanced drawdown. I'm worried that we're going to repeat uh, what we did in the 1990s, which was to cut investment disproportionately. We're doing that now. You almost have to in the early part of a drawdown because it takes a while until forces can be eliminated and you can get the money to minimize cuts in investment. But we never restored them in the 1990s. And uh, you may have heard, if you were in Frank Kendall's session today, he expressed the same concern. I share it that we'll go to a level of investment that's not enough to sustain this force over time. And so we'll take a near-term readiness problem we have now and turn it into a large or longer-term readiness uh, because we don't have enough money for investment. But I'll go back to my fundamental point. We desperately need budget stability. We're a month and a half into fiscal year 14, and I still don't know within 30 to $50 billion the amount of money that we'll have to spend in this year really restricts our ability to make effective use of the taxpayers' dollars. We need budget stability. That's all I have. Thank you. General. Thanks, Tom. I'm humbled to be sitting with this august group. Um, but I tell you, I'll start by taking some umbrage with the title of our panel, Reforming the, the Department of Defense, because I think we need to broaden the aperture a bit. Uh, we just concluded in the Air Force an eight-month excruciating process of building an integrated, balanced, uh, enterprise-wide view of how to produce a set of air power capabilities that we contribute to the panoply of things that the Defense Department's able to do. By the time that goes through the third floor and over to the hill and through the, the machinations, its resemblance when it comes out as an NDAA will not look a lot like what we submitted. So when we talk about inefficiencies and, and uh, bloatedness, I mean, it doesn't just come from those of us inside the building, it, we all have a part. I've been in 36 years. Uh, when the Air Force was twice the size it was when I came in, we could deal with, we could deal with that, uh, absorb those inefficiencies and still uh, cover the things we need to cover. At half the size and much higher rate of operations tempo than ever before, those inefficiencies are really hampering our ability to produce the things that we have to produce. And so we have some very difficult problems to take on here in the near future. Pay and compensation, as the chairman talked about this morning or this at lunch today, that's going to overwhelm us in the next uh, five to ten years if we don't deal with it uh, right away. Uh, as Mr. Hale said, force structure, infrastructure, as the chairman said, I'm, I'm not going to argue whether the budget should be bigger or not, but, but let me produce the most possible air power I can from the, the budget you do give me. And I can only do that if I can make the fundamental business decisions of sizing my force to fit within the allotted amount of money. And uh, unfortunately, that's a highly political issue. It, it gets to constituencies and, and industries and a lot of pressures that shape military judgment in, or best military advice into uh, what, is, what fits into the, into the process. So we're going to need courage on all our parts to make some very hard decisions as we move forward. Thanks. Well, thanks very much. Uh, first, I want to say, uh, as a former comptroller, I think Bob Hale's done a phenomenal job. When I was there, I gave out money. He keeps taking it away, and somehow he's managed to keep on an even keel, and I don't know how. Uh, a couple of observations. The first is, as Bob said, we need stability. Um, I travel quite a bit, and uh, we have some people here from uh, other countries, so they can uh, say that I'm, I'm mis misrepresenting them, but everybody I speak to, says two th things to me. The first is, what's with you people? It's literally, sometimes even in more graphic terms. The second is, how can we rely on you? So you heard General Dempsey, you've heard others talk about allies, working with allies, the need to integrate with allies. They don't trust us. And they don't trust us because they don't know what we're going to be doing in four months' time, much less in four years' time or in 20 years' time. So that's a major problem. It, it is not just internal to our budget process. It goes to the fundamentals of our strategy, which is a strategy that involves working with others, especially with lower force levels than we have today. The second point that I'd like to emphasize is we talked, Bob again, talked about courage. Well, we've talked about reform. The first time I came across 
hearings on acquisition reform was in 1975 when Bob and I both started in this business. It's great. We keep talking about it. We just don't do anything about it. We create new institutions. We create processes. We've even created a system for rapid acquisition to get around our own acquisition system, believe it or not. We have to do something about it. And that means biting the bullet on the size of our contractor force. And I hear I'm talking about service contracting, which is more than 50% of our acquisition budget. It means coming to grips with how many civil servants we need on the civilian side. We'd added, we've added tens of thousands since 2000. I don't know what the difference has been in terms of output, but the input's been huge. We really need to think about facilities. And of course, we have to think about the personnel budget, and especially the healthcare budget, which is very hard to talk about. But most people don't realize that the larger percentage of the defense health program is actually in our operations budget, which comes back to the point, if we don't have money to operate, if we don't have money to exercise, will our allies believe we're really going to be there when they need us? agree with so much of what has already been said, so I will not repeat it, but let me just go back to first principles. You know, the, to protect American prosperity and security, we have two fundamental things that we have to do as a nation. One, we have to get our economic house in order, uh, and that is through event getting to a budget deal with all of the elements uh, that have been, that we know uh, are there. And second, we have to sustain the strongest military in the world. Sequestration doesn't help us on either front. And, and, and in fact, it hurts us, uh, particularly in terms of, of the military. The biggest lesson we have to learn from past drawdowns is that um, the easy way to do a drawdown is to balance the budget on the back of the force. And that leads you to a hollow force, a force that cannot actually protect the nation. So as we deal with this situation, we have to protect modernization and readiness, which means we have to look for money in the defense enterprise in trying to get more efficient um, and to, to get after things like excess overhead, to get after things like excess infrastructure and so forth. Now, I want to be clear, no amount of defense reform can make sequestration acceptable. Um, however, even if we get relief from sequestration, the Department of Defense never gets the resources it wants there's always some degree of budget pressure. Part of responsible stewardship of taxpayer dollar is, is doing better on, on defense reform. And here I think we can take a page from the private sector. For example, overhead reduction. Um, we spend about $190 billion as a department on overhead. As Dove said, 800,000 US government civilians, another almost 700,000 contract civilians, we need to set very aggressive targets in delayering and in really reshaping and getting leaner uh, in terms of our uh, overhead. This is something we know how to do. If you ask company executives, uh, Fortune 100 companies around the world, um, they have delayered. They've gone from 14 layers to eight layers. They have cut 25, 30% of, out of their man management overhead, and they've become more agile and high performing in the process. Now, obviously, there are some challenges in terms of how you apply that in government, but it can be done. Acquisition. When you, again, look at any major manufacturing firm, they like to get their programs on that nice experience curve, where the, the hundredth or the thousandth unit that's produced is much cheaper than the first one. If you look at DOD major acquisition programs, across the board, they are off that experience curve. And if you look over the last decade, we have spent about $170 billion that we didn't need to spend because those programs are off the experience curve. If we took the steps to get them back on, which is, is a knowable thing, I mean, it's something that uh, industry knows how to do, um, we could save 2 to $5 billion per year. So there's several examples like this. We need to bring that best expertise to bear on how we manage the department, but we need help from Congress. This requires Congress giving the secretary the authorities to reshape his workforce, uh, to make some hard choices. Sequestration takes that flexibility away. Um, we need to give, give the department what they need to manage in these very difficult times. 
I guess defense reform is probably the oldest chestnut annual perennial uh, in the entire defense uh, debate. The first year that, uh, that the Defense Department existed, uh, Secretary Jim Forrestal was given a, uh, a reform from Congress that uh, enabled him to expand his personal staff, the OSD staff, to as many as 50 people. And uh, every year in the 65 years since that reform, there has been a series of reform uh, legislated uh, enactments and some executive uh, orders that have created, in every case, a new organization, more people, and, uh, and that has happened every single year since the Pentagon was uh, formed. The problem is that in the private sector, the disciplines of the market force a pruning all the time, a re restructuring and a pruning and a reshaping. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen in government. So every single office that has been created to reform the Pentagon for the last 65 years is still in existence and is significantly larger than it was when it was created. The poor Secretary of Defense is like Marley's ghost, dragging around these hundreds of heavy chains of reform that have been imposed on him. Nobody ever takes one off. And so at some point in the last 10 years, uh, it's hard to place exactly, but we really did reach a tipping point where the dysfunction in the system, the system has become so large, which as Michelle has pointed out, imagine that a million five hundred thousand full-time civilian employees. And it has grown to that even as the force that it is supposed to manage has shrunk by more than half. It is less than half of what it was uh, when uh, uh, the Reagan administration at the height of their, uh, their buildup. We are spending roughly the same adjusted for inflation today. Today's budget is about $525 billion uh, without sequestration. That's roughly the same at the height of the, uh, uh, of the Reagan buildup, adjusted for inflation. Yet we're getting less than half of the output, fewer than half of the numbers and tonnage of ships, fewer than more like a quarter of the uh, tactical uh, uh, aircraft for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines, and much less than half for the United States Army equipment and communications and logistics and so forth. So what's going on? And so what we've got to do is recognize the problem, that uh, it really is time to, uh, uh, to act, and it can be done. The, uh, the fact is that uh, if we recognize what must be done, then Congress will follow. But the defense community, and that's kind of a, uh, a stretch to use that term, but all of us in this room, as well as those in the government, have got to start speaking with one voice. First priority is exactly as been laid out by the previous speakers, we have got to cut the overhead with 40 different joint requirements committees. Nobody, uh, it's a classic case of the, uh, the 10,000 ants on a log floating down the Mississippi and everyone thinking that they're, running, they're steering the ship. Uh, and, and it can be done. And so uh, if we recognize that and start, then there are things that have been done in the past that work. I mean, Michelle mentioned what this administration has done, which is fantastic, the, uh, the uh, uh, rapid acquisition and fielding program. Uh, the, the weapons that that program under this administration has, has gotten into the hands of the, uh, the combatant commanders and the, the troops in the field has averaged from the first back of the envelope writing of a requirement to the fielding of the first article like the MRAP, it has averaged 401 days. But all the rest of the ACAT 1 and 2 programs are under DOD 5000 and its many rewritten reforms. And the average for those programs 
from the requirement, which today takes four and a half years just to get a requirements paper, to get the first fielding of an, a vehicle is 22 years. 22 years versus 401. Uh, in the 80s, the Pentagon showed the way of what real competition and dual sourcing can do. The Air Force fighter engine program is a perfect example. So there are things that have worked, reforms that have, have really made a difference. Unfortunately, many of them have gradually disappeared, been forgotten. The institutional memory in the building is frankly not very good. So my note is an optimistic one. We can do it, but a sequester is a minor issue compared to what this bloat is doing to our, uh, our defenses. Thank you. I was, I'm glad you had that final point because I was tempted to ask you to unpack your statement because I was hearing you say that the sequester was good for the Pentagon as a forcing function. So, so thank you for saying that. Senator Sessions wanted a, a, a point of personal privilege here, and I well, understand the rules, so please. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, to say that money is a big challenge right now. It's a forcing function and it's reality. But this conference is very good because it's becoming very clear to me as a member of the Congress that we do not have the kind of unified vision for the defense and national security vision of America that we need at this point in history. I don't think the president is, has been clear about it. Congress is not clear about it. Republicans and Democrats, uh, I'm not even sure they disagree. I'm not sure what their vision is. So I think out of all of this, as we go forward, we need to build an intellectual case for the kind of involvement and leadership the United States should have in the world to come. And uh, then we need to figure out where to get the money to fund it. But let me, let me follow up on that if I could, because you know it shouldn't be forgotten that sequester was a poison pill inside a lockbox that wasn't supposed to happen, and it did happen. The government shutdown was not supposed to happen, but it did happen. So what can the leadership do? And Mr. Hale, I'm gonna to come to you next as the senior administration official on the panel. I mean, you guys have gotta get your act together. How can you move ahead toward compromise? Well, the generals, you know, they came over and they were telling us how bad it was, and I asked them if they knew the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as the commander-in-chief down there, maybe they ought to be talking to him, too. Uh, but Congress does fund the money and put up the money or not put up the money. And um, so I believe the sequester is damaging in a way that goes beyond rational management. Uh, it was a part of the Budget Control Act. It is the law of the United States of America, uh, and it was intended because it was written and it was passed. So that's the, the, the problem. Uh, I do think we could alter it. Uh, I've met with Chairman Levin, uh, Senator McCain and I talked yesterday. He's very interested. Uh, uh, um, uh, so we're looking, Mr. Hale and others, uh, talked to Secretary Hagel about this. I think we could smooth out these cuts. We're due to take another $20 billion reduction this year and it's hard to get that kind of saving this year. If you take steps now, you can get savings over time. We need to uh, smooth this out. General Dempsey says he wants consistency. A smooth path would give him that. Flexibility, we absolutely need to give him flexibility. And he says time, and this would give time instead of all happening at once. I believe Congress should respond at least in that regard, and it wouldn't necessarily add any more debt or actually any more spending than was promised in the BCA sequester. We name, so at least, that's at least something I believe we could do that would be positive. Comptroller Hale, are you hopeful? You're sitting around the table within the administration, within the Pentagon. <laughs> do you see any kind of critical mass moving toward a compromise and a deal? Well, actually, I think I'd <laughs> defer more to the Congress since they're the ones who makes a deal. But I, I suppose if I've earned the happy hail, it's because I do keep hoping uh, we need this, uh, we need some agreement. I think there may be some growing sense uh, in the Congress and in the White House of the importance of this. You asked what we should do as an administration. I mean, we certainly owe it to the 
Congress and the American public to do everything we can to explain what happens. As General Dempsey said, ultimately, Congress appropriates money. It's our job to make the very best use of it we can, and I think the services are trying to do that. Uh, for, for example, I mean, the Air Force uh, last year, and General Hostage can expand on this, stopped flying for three months at 12 combat coded squadrons. I think they are looking at it, because they didn't have much time to figure out how to do it. They are looking at a better way, or at least a less damaging way of doing that. But it's going to hurt. It already has hurt readiness. If we stay with a sequester budget, readiness will not get better and may get worse. And I worry greatly about the state of our civilian workforce. Perhaps it should be smaller, but those that we keep, we don't want to keep beating them up. We've had three years of pay freezes. We've had changes in retirement benefits for those coming in that are new. We, we furloughed them this summer. We furloughed them again this fall. Our civilian employees are starting to wonder whether they're going to have a job, and I'm afraid some of them are starting to wonder whether they want a job with the federal government, and we may lose the best. So. Uh, we owe it to the Congress uh, to say as clearly as we can what the problems are and to continue to indicate we desperately need uh, a budget deal and some reasonable budget stability. Right. Since this panel, the entire conference is looking out to 2025, my one-two question for General Hostage and, and Dov Zakheim is looking out to 2025, the recurring question, in a time of limited budgets, what are things the military will be unable to do, and maybe missions it can surrender while still carrying out the mandate. And then the tougher question, I know there's lots of industry personnel, uh, what are some weapon systems we don't need to buy anymore? Well, the, in an ideal scenario, in the range of capabilities you produce, I would like to have multiple ways to produce it based on the unique solution or the unique problem we might have to go solve. So. I can do close air support with a variety of different platforms, uh, and, or I can do certain types of surveillance with a variety of different <coughs> platforms. In a perfect world, I'd like to have that multitude of, of ways to do the problem to fit the unique uh, situation you hit. When we're reducing budgets, ideally I would reduce force structure and I'd give up some of that redundant, redundant's a bad term because it sounds bad to the budget guys, some of that multi-layered capability to produce uh, effects, I'll give up some of that, that, uh, that flexibility. The only way to really save the, the kind of dollars that Mr. Hale needs from me is to make entire weapon systems go away. I can lop a squadron off of every squadron I own, but, and I'll save some money for each one of those, but I really save the big dollars when I make an entire weapon system go away because I save the logistics infrastructure, the depot infrastructure, the maintenance of manning infrastructure for the whole system. So we are looking at what are the capabilities we produce, what does the national strategy require for that range of military options, and then giving up those things that uh, provide, provide extra capability but you know, we'll take the risk of not having that extra uh, means. The A-10 is the perfect example. The last thing in the world I want to do is give up the A-10 and its, its incredible capability in close air support. But I can do close air support with a lot of other platforms. And while not as, as ideally as with the A-10, A-10 is not going to do me a lot of good in a high-end scenario in the Pacific. And so if I've, if I've got to re have reduced capability, I'll give the A-10 up before I'll give up other things. So this is kind of, so I talked about eight months of balance and integration, that's the kind of thing we're trying to struggle with, how to fit ourselves into the, the, the amount of resource given and still produce the range of capabilities, the full range of capabilities, albeit maybe not with as many options. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take it a different, a different way. Um, actually, let me start with the A-10. Uh, Air Force has wanted to get rid of the A-10 for at least 20 years. Um, changed its mind after the first Gulf War when the A-10 proved pretty capable. And I think the entire question you've put is the wrong question, frankly, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> that was him doing his Don and, and Rumsfeld I'll, impersonation. And, and I'll tell you, uh, let me tell you why, in all seriousness. As long as we keep looking at, A, what do we do about the sequester? Because that means when the sequester goes away, everybody's going to forget about the kinds of reforms John Lehman and I and Michelle have talked about. <coughs> and B, as long as we keep looking at the weapon systems, and not at the other things that are killing our budget. The number one thing that's killing our budget is personnel costs. You know, in about 15 years' time, give or take, we will be spending nothing else except money on personnel. 
when you've got a, a, a defense health program that's in the vicinity of $50 billion, which is bigger than most of our NATO allies' budgets, you've got a very different problem. And I think for far too long, we have looked at the metal benders as the solution to these sorts of issues. I believe that, first of all, within seven to 10 years, when the gas and the oil come online, we're not going to have this problem. My worry is, if we're thinking about 25 years from now, it's between now and those seven years that we've got to get it right. If you take money out of operations, as I pointed out earlier, you are telling your allies you're not interested. And if you take money out of research and acquisition generally and procurement, you are essentially saying, we'll be okay now, we're not going to be okay later. The place to look is the personnel accounts, and the overhead, as has been mentioned, and we have to cut back. Bob's absolutely right. We've got some terrific civilians. We also have some not so terrific civilians. And we've <coughs> got to be very, very careful not to keep the not so terrific ones. And one other point to reinforce what John Lehman said. I came across this. I, I hadn't heard of this before. How many people have heard of an office called Parka? It's not something you wear. OK. Let me tell you what Parka is. And this is the exact size of the problem we have. It is the Office of Performance Assessments and Root Cause Analysis, which is meant to look at why we have overruns. It was created in 2010 or 2009. So what did we do to think about how we deal with cost overruns? We created an office and staffed it with people. That is the problem. I guess my only concern of, about the overhead and personnel question is you could probably find every defense secretary uh, going back several generations who has pledged to attack wasteful overhead, cost to overrun, and personnel. So what can change to actually allow those savings to be harvested? Well, one, we have two big problems. Um, they actually both start with the Office of Personnel Management, which has been hiding under the table for years. OPM sets the standards for who we hire as civilians, okay? We therefore cannot hire the most educated people because OPM doesn't allow you to. Um, OPM sets the standards for the kinds of civilians we hire. We've got to do something about that. Number two, we have to be much more precise about the contractors we hire on the services side. I was on a commission that looked at wartime contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. We spent $192 billion between 2001 and 2011 on these sorts of folks. We calculated we wasted between 31 and 60 billion bucks. My guess is 60 billion was probably the right number. With 60 billion dollars, Bob Hale wouldn't have as many gray hairs. Right. Um, for Secretary Flournoy, um, the theme of this panel is supposed to be lessons learned of the past 10 years of war and sequester, looking to 2025, as somebody who probably has more experience in QDR than anyone, the building's about to embark upon a QDR, which we hope will be significant and give direction. Are there lessons from the ones that you have written and the ones that you have studied that could inform the, this process? And I'll put out there in a somewhat provocative way, my analysis, not yours. The current strategy cited by everyone from General Dempsey to the Secretary is the defense strategic guidance, which I would submit is none of the above. Uh, it's a series of lines of operations and, and missions and not a real strategy that can drive the kind of thinking required. So as you look at these coming months in the QDR, what advice would you give? How would you shape that? How could you turn that into a strategy document that truly could drive the budget, not the other way around? Well, uh, I will uh, take personal offense at the, your criticism of the strategic guidance <laughs> because I uh, helped put it together. And I do think it is actually, I mean, strategy is about being clear about what are the priorities you're going to protect and where you're going to accept and manage risk. And I actually do think that document does a pretty good, a better job of that than any previous QDR strategy had but I won't be defensive. Um, uh, but the thing I, I want to highlight, so we're, we're, we're no, all the, in this thing, together. the thing I want to highlight um, was the process that produced that, because I think there, there was, that was something that for me was a lesson learned having been through all kinds of previous reviews. And it, what was extraordinary about the process is when uh, in 2011, the Budget Control Act was passed, $487 billion taken away from the Defense Department over the coming decade, big change in the resource picture. 
So rather than having a bunch of policy people go into a room and try to rewrite a strategy by themselves in light of that new constraint, the president said, you know, this is, this is a really, we're at a strategic inflection point. We're coming out of a decade of war. We have this, these new resource constraints. Uh, we need to come together as a department. I want to see the chairman, the secretary, all of the chiefs, all of the service secretaries, the, co -com the combatant commanders. We, as a sort of, uh, you know, leave your parochial hat at the door, come into the room, and how are we together going to safeguard the security of this country? They met for not one, not two, three multi-hour sessions uh, as a leadership. And it was out of those discussions with the full participation and buy-in from the people who would actually be held accountable for implementing the strategy that we came up with those priorities and that sense of how, where are we going to manage risk. That is the kind of process. To me, that was the key lesson learned. You've got to have that kind of stakeholder engagement going forward. The challenge is you can't just do it inside the executive branch alone. And here I would come back again. We have got to find a way to engage with the key members of Congress to come up with some consensus way forward on the overall budget situation for the country, uh, a, a budget deal, and on a common vision for how are we going to protect the defense of this nation. We are playing a very dangerous game. And it could come and bite us soon with you know, a readiness problem resulting in an inadequate response and lives lost, or it can come later. But it will come if we keep down the road that we're on. But as someone who's spoken to the public, spoken out, how do you convince the American people that there's a readiness problem until it's too late. I mean, the phrase Task Force Smith is suddenly common knowledge yet again, something that had been a historic this, footnote. How do you tell the American people you have to buy readiness now, even though you're not needing it yet? You know, I think, um, to put it back on you, I think the journalists among us, the media, <laughs> have to shine a light on this. We need to be you know, going out and talking to the pilots who aren't flying. The, pilot, you know, the, the soldier who's decided to leave an army he loves because he's not being allowed to train anymore. Um, the American people think the US military is magic because it is so extraordinary, and it has performed so well, and it seems there's no feat that they can't accomplish. It, but you know, it is wonderful. It is not magic. It needs care and feeding. It needs investment. It needs great leadership. And so you know, we neglect it or we under-resource it at our peril. And, and I think that's, but we have to show people before it becomes a crisis where there's actual loss of life or some horrible you know, consequence, we have to show people what is happening in the lives of people as they come home from Iraq and Afghanistan and as they decide, is this a military I want to stay in? Right. Secretary Lehman, this is a perfect segue to you, sir. Your, your name was invoked this morning at the Asia Pacific session because here we are in the library of a president who oversaw a 600-ship navy. Now it's down to half that number today. One can argue that it's more capable, but I, I'd like two questions, sir. What are your concerns about the readiness gap looking ahead to 2025? And as someone who so successfully helped lobby for that navy, what was your secret? Well, I think that, that Michelle uh, uh, has put her finger on uh, something the American people, um, uh, with regard to readiness, I don't think it's that they're ignorant of what uh, what makes readiness. They understand that pilots have to fly and tank drivers have to drive tanks. <clears throat> I really get the feeling, and again, my scientific research is primarily in New York City and among Republicans, so it may not be a totally representative uh, crowd, but. Uh, people understand it, people not, not so much interested in defense. And they, it's not that they don't really understand readiness, it's that they don't trust the military in this or the previous administration. They don't want them to have a ready, uh, uh, a ready military because they're sick to death of land wars in Asia and the Middle East. And so they do not want to have a ready tool at the president's hand or the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff hand. So we've got to work our way through that. 
And as far as the Navy goes, the world has not gotten any smaller. And the fact is, it's gotten a lot more dangerous. At least in the Cold War, we had the polarization of all the, the metal filings in a bipolar world that was pretty strictly disciplined by both sides. Today, uh, the, the numbers of disturbers of the peace and potential nuclear disturbers of the peace is a, in some ways a much greater danger. So deterrence uh, is more required even than in the Cold War, yet we have half the size force in all of the forces to do that. And the Navy particularly is going down that same road that we saw in the 70s. Oh yeah, we can just, we'll make the uh, battle group stay out there for nine months instead of six months, and we're, we can do more with less. Well, that is a formula for catastrophe, and it's already happening. You're seeing, you're seeing aviators in both the Air Force and the Navy leaving in droves. You're, seeing, you're soon going to see the sailors, as the economy starts to pick up, leaving in droves because Navy spouses will not put up with this. So we're hollowing out, whether we like it or not, uh, the force. Now, this is not something that you can fix just by ending sequester or increasing the, uh, the, the defense budget. Uh, the problem is that the, the Republicans' automatic default for, oh, look at, the, look at this terrible defense problem we have, is throw more money at it. And the Democrats' default response is, we've got to centralize things more. We've got to have a new office of CAPE or a new office of this or that. And that's what reform, 98% of the reforms that have been made in the last 65 years have been one or other of those kinds of formulas. Thank you. Um, I'm not Oprah Winfrey, otherwise I would tell you, look under your seat for a key to your very own up-armored Humvee. Uh, <laughs> but what I can do is invite you to engage in dialogue with this distinguished panel of experts. And all I ask is that you come to one of the microphones, identify yourself and your affiliation, and the floor will be yours. Sir. Jeff M. Nichols with the, the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, in many cases, major defense reform has been catalyzed by dramatic or even tragic events uh, in order to kind of break through that institutional resistance. For example, the, uh, the failure of the Desert One operation in 1980 really came to symbolize the need for jointness within the military force. And, it, and eventually that took the form of the Goldwater's Nichols, Goldwater Nichols uh, Reform Act. And so my question for you is, do you think that the budget cuts that we're seeing today are acting enough as a burning platform in order to drive the institutional change that we currently need? Who cares to answer? Sir. Well, I, I certainly think we're moving in that direction. I think we'll have different opinions, and I invite them from other members of the panel. Like almost every uh, administration, this one has chosen to uh, engage in a number of defense reforms. And, and I would stack them up against any, given my knowledge of past administrations that, that have gone on in the past. We terminated a breathtaking number of weapons. Think back, we no longer have the DDG-1000 program in favor of the DDG-51. We canceled the Army's future combat system in favor of the ground combat vehicle. Terminated TSAT satellite in favor of the AAHF satellite. Ended production of the F-22 and the C-17. We did get rid of a major, uh, maybe first time, a major unit in the Joint Forces Command after a bitter political fight, I might add, uh, and a number of other units as well. We were working desperately to try to consolidate email servers and our IT, strategic sourcing. But there's broader forces at work here that explain, I think, the issues John Lehman is raising about 600 ship navies. We have chosen, I call it the acquisition rule of two to three, uh, new generations of weapons are two to three times as expensive in terms of unit cost than the ones that follow. The lead ship in the Ford class is going to be about $12 billion. We could hope the follow-ons are 8 to 10, uh, but they will be several times the cost of a Nimitz-class carrier. The JSF will certainly be substantially more expensive than the F-16. We need to either curb our appetites uh, or decide we're just going to have a smaller military or, conversely, of course, a much larger budget. We've seen the same phenomena go on in our operating costs, which just grow uh, due to, and I don't think it's overhead here, it's our choice of stealth weapons, which are extremely expensive to maintain. It's healthcare in recent years, 
And now we've got personnel costs that are following that same trend and that we're trying to, uh, trying to slow in terms of its growth. So there are fundamental trends at work uh, that I think are explaining uh, why we've got higher budgets today than in the 50s and 60s and 1.3 1 million people versus two and a half. And we're going to have to come to grips with them. And I would be the first to agree. I don't think we've fundamentally done that. I don't think any administration has in the last 20 years. General Hostage, did I see, sir? Did you want to say something? Uh, I'd say that uh, we dodged a bullet this summer. Uh, you talked about uh, Desert One. On the uh, 17th of July, we got permission to raid our investment accounts to try to replenish readiness. On that day, I had eight combat-ready airplanes in the entire continental United States, where there had been a Korea, a, uh, in Iran, a Syria. I didn't have anything to send, because I had grounded the, the fleet in order to take the resources I needed to send those units that were going into combat or named operations. They, they used all the resources I had. Now, the summer was draconian because of the triple whammy of OCO reimbursement uh, sequester and then the NDAA coming six months into the fiscal year. So the, the effect was magnified significantly. But had there been a crisis this summer, we'd have had the train wreck that you described with Desert One. We, we just can't allow ourselves to continue to run that risk year after year. Um, we talked about 14. Uh, Mr. Hale talked about things will be better in 14. My greatest fears will say, yeah, better is good. This better is better than last summer, so things are okay. My flying hour will be, flying hour program will be 15% less than it needed to be in 14. But I'm starting from a, a really deep hole, and I'm getting 15% less of the resources I thought I was going to get to build the force to try to continue to dig out of that hole. So the catastrophe is out there. We just got to get ourselves back to ready before it shows up. Let me just correct the record, unless we get away from sequestration. I didn't mean to say uh, 14 will be better. It oh, won't no. be. It could be worse if we stay at the sequestration levels. At the sequest sequestration level, we took $30 billion in actual cut last year. This will be another $20 billion this year, FY14. Then 15, FY15, will begin a 2.5% increase each year. Uh, so this is by far the toughest year for the Defense Department, no question about it. And I think management-wise, it's too fast, too early, and we would do better if we spread it out. Now, the Defense Department and the President, to some degree, has proposed some changes in entitlements within the Defense Department that's out of the Defense Department budget. So if you had some co-pays and some other things on health care and benefits, that could be moved to the point of the spear and away from some of the places that it, uh, but everybody's nervous about veterans and this kind of thing, I just got to tell you. So it's going to take a bipartisan president and the Congress all together before we're going to come in and make any real alterations in what people have become expecting to, you know, veterans and others have, have, have been expecting to get, but they've been, they've been, the, the benefits they are getting today are larger than they were uh, 20 years ago in many ways. So there's some Defense Department numbers suggest you could add $40 billion over 10 years as a result of some of those changes, at least that's the figure General Dempsey mentioned, including a pay, the growth in the rate of pay being somewhat less. We, Congress during the war was very generous. We, we gave pay raises and I guess the administration asked for them above uh, inflation consistently. I don't think the problem in the military today is the pay. Uh, there are other things that concern uh, men and women more than the salary right now. But uh, we have to be real careful, as General Dempsey said. You didn't want to be doing this all one time if we do something like that. Let's be clear, get it over with. Uh, so there's some things that can be done within this framework. The disagreement politically is that the president is still insisting that he won't uh, provide money for the Defense Department without tax increases. And the uh, BCA had no tax increases in it. It was simply an agreement to reduce spending, the growth of spending, projected to grow $10 trillion, to only grow $8 trillion. 
but because we didn't touch Medicare, Social Security, food stamps, all the other entitlement programs, zero cuts, uh, it's fallen disproportionately on the Defense Department. And um, just, so this thing is really hard. I mean, good people are wrestling with this debt thing. I mean, I, 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 I lose sleep on it. It's really hard. Because if you take money out of Social Security, that's a trust fund. People pay Social Security off their paycheck every week, their retirement. So if you cut Social Security, should you then spend that money, Social Security money on defense? Uh, but there are other entitlements out there that are not trust fund entitlements that seem to me a little bit different, <coughs> uh, that you could uh, maybe use that to move some money around. So it's a tough time right now. And all of this, again, do we have a consensus that the United States needs to lead in the world? Are we going to be, pejoratively, they say, the policemen of the world now? What about other countries? They won't supply, they won't contribute anything like what we ought to contribute. So you've got this feedback out there, and it's a, a dicey time, I think, for the future of the country as we begin to make a decision about what we're going to do, the role we're going to play as a nation uh, in the decades to come. Doug, did you want to jump in those? Uh, yeah, my, my worry actually, it's a little bit ironic. I think the sequester clearly needs to go away. But my worry is, sort of taking off from what the senator said, it's so hard right now to get Congress to do anything, say, on pay and benefits. If the sequester goes away, is Congress going to simply walk away from that problem? So as we try to get rid of the sequester, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we still have to make these other changes. And to go to your original question, Tom, which is what might we have to give up in 2025? If you look at the shrinkage, and John Lehman pointed it out, you know, the man who gave us 600 ships now looks at a Navy with 360. You can't get around the world with 360 ships. We are, yes, we have four ships in the Mediterranean. That's all fine and good. They're missile defense ships. Suppose there's some kind of flap over gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, where you have overla overlapping claims of Turks, Greeks, Egyptians, Israelis, Lebanese. I mean, you talk about a perfect storm. And everybody's going to want the US Navy to get involved. Missile defense ships aren't going to be the only things. So that's one area that we've already pretty much walked away from. You don't have to wait till 2025. Sir. Just to calibrate uh, what we were talking about earlier, uh, the, uh, you know, this administration's, uh, one of their themes has been it, it, it's uh, a shame to waste a good crisis. Uh, what was uh, discussed earlier, if, if Congress solves sequester, the chance to really make the reforms that can be done is going to go away um, if we don't get that in motion soon. Uh, we talk about losing $500 billion over 10 years uh, from defense acquisition and uh, other programs. Uh, but the GAO just reported, testified under oath two weeks ago that they have identified an additional 411 billion, nearly the same order of magnitude, of approved at the lower level uh, cost growth in just the top 100 programs in the Pentagon. So right there, without, by allowing the current dysfunctional, crazy town system that we have under uh, DOD 5000, we have lost, just since the last GAO report, as much as sequester is going to take over the next 10 years. So we got to keep proportion in mind as to where we need to be crying and where we need to be putting the attention to fix. Yes, Michelle. I would, I would just say that I, I don't think, you know, certainly sequester is creating pressure, but I don't think if we were did the smart thing and found a better way than sequester, that the pressure on the Pentagon would go away. Because if you look inside the budget, it's, it, it, the, it, it's, it's fundamentally different than it was you know, 20, 30 years ago. Because we do have these unsustainable 
uh, uh, unsustainable growth in personnel costs, in uh, O&M overhead costs, and so forth. I personally would like to see have us have a discussion with the American people, with the Congress, about what does it mean to keep faith with the men and women who serve. Whenever the Department of Defense, and Bob Hale has more scar tissue on his body than anybody else on this issue, goes, tries to go and make a reasonable pro proposal for compensation reform or health care reform on the Hill, he gets accused of breaking faith with the men and women who serve. I am a, the wife of a 26-year year veteran. Um, I'm a beneficiary of benefits. But when I think about keeping faith with the men and women who serve, it's not just, you know, what's the pay, what's the retirement, what's the health care, how much do I pay for my health care. It is also, if my son does enter the Marine Corps, as he's talking about, will he have the equipment he needs? Will he have the training he needs? Do we give these people what they need to go into harm's way and take risks on the part of the nation and, as General Dempsey said, not have it be a fair fight? That is part of keeping faith with the men and women who serve, too, not just protecting entitlements. We need to have that conversation as a nation because the entitlements issue has become a political one on the Hill, that who's going to be more patriotic by putting more money into compensation, and it's simply not sustainable because it's having real costs on the, host on, the, on the readiness and modernization of the forces of people like General Hostage and so forth. But we've got to have an honest conversation about that on Capitol Hill. Thank you very much. I think Congress would have a different approach to it now that the deployment, so heavy deployment in combat is not out there. So I think the Defense Department will be respected in some of the proposals I expect that they would give us to not have the same rate of growth of pay uh, as we've had in the past. Thank you. Congressman, would you allow me to preempt you for just a second? A question from this side. General Schwartz, please. Thank you for allowing me to preempt you, Congressman. I appreciate it. Just to follow on, if everyone here has spoken of the need to control costs within the building, that being the case, a question, Tom, for anybody on the panel is why was the input to the congressionally mandated commission on compensation um, less specific than perhaps it might have been? Let me take a shot at that. The timing was bad, Norty. Uh, I mean, we are in the process of trying to reach agreement within the administration on a set of proposals. It would have preempted that debate. Uh, including the time to give the Joint Chiefs uh, uh, the, the opportunity to reach agreement. I think, as we said in the letter to the Commission, when that process is finished and we make proposals next year, we will certainly share them with the uh, uh, Commission. And understanding they've got some goals, we also offered in that same letter to send our staffs there and have informal discussions with them. Timing was bad. That Commission should have been set up to, uh, my view, to parallel more the uh, uh, the, the, the timing process of the uh, president's submissions. Thank you. It well, doesn't yeah, mean we're not I'm thinking about it. Commission and, yeah. uh, so is General Corelli, who's back there. So Pete, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the timing is the timing. Uh, we were set up. We followed the rules. It took a very long time for, to get the president's principles. And then we got this letter from DOD. Um, and some of our people on the commission have already reacted in the press. I'm not going to do that now, but I'll say this. Given the kind of response we got from DOD, we see this as we're just going to push ahead. Our job is to come up with, walk our way through this minefield of compensation and come up with the best suggestions we ha can to be fair and keep faith with the people in uniform, both now and in the future, and at the same time, see how something can be done to prevent the situation that's growing every year that will prevent, it's basically a trade-off between materiel on the one side and human resources on the other. We have so heavily tipped in the, in the direction of human resources that we're penalizing the material resources that the people who are gonna fight 
five, 10, 15 years down the road are going to need. So we got what we got from DOD. If you guys come up, Bob, with some other letter, of course, that'll be great. But we're just going to move ahead. We cannot sit on our hands. We owe it to the American people and to the Congress that created this commission to move ahead. We can't do anything less. Sir, your question, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ken Calvert, I'm on Defense Appropriations. I also serve on the Budget Committee myself. Um, 10,000 people a day, 70,000 people a week, uh, 180,000 a month, 3 million, over 3 million a year going on Social Security and Medicare. That's basically the problem we've got. We have a huge mandatory spending problem, as uh, Senator Sessions has pointed out. Uh, but we hu have a huge problem, on, as, as Secretary Lehman pointed out, with the number of uh, civilian employees within the Pentagon. And uh, Congress has refused to address the problem. It seems that the administration, what, whatever administration, is incapable of tackling that issue. What's it going to take? I mean, we, we put together a BRAC a number of years ago uh, to close military bases because Congress doesn't like closing military bases. So what, should we have a personnel BRAC? Uh, something, I don't know what the idea is, uh, but we cannot continue to have a military uh, that's saddled with a million and a half folks uh, that we don't need. I mean, we obviously need some, but we don't need a million and a half. Uh, and so uh, do you have any suggestions? Uh, I know Gordon England had some suggestions about it uh, that we can put in legislative language that maybe we could pass. Michelle, please. Uh, I do, th you know, I would first just caveat with this by saying there are some extraordinary civil servants and we do need uh, a core of them, of that talent, to do key functions in the department. But we have had more than a decade of, growth, of unfettered growth. The civilian workforce has grown by 15% in that time, even as the military force has gone down by about 4%. Um, and uh, you know, we have more layers, more bureaucracy, more people than, than we need. When I was in policy in uh, the Clinton administration, it seemed pretty big at about 600 now, policies over 1,000 people. That's just one little microcosm. I'm not picking on my former organization, which was wonderful. But we've had a lot of growth. We need to do some, some, some pruning, and also in terms of the degree of contractor support, because it's almost double, doubling the civilian workforce. If you go to private industry, how do they do that? You take a global telecom company, $50 billion. They go through a delayering process. Again, they get. 25, 30% of overhead savings out of that, and oh, by the way, a more high performing and agile organization. That's a, you know, $50 billion company is pretty big. It's, this is something that can be done at scale. You can also find cases where it's been done in either the public sector abroad or in labor restricted environments where there are things comparable to civil service rules. What the administration needs is A, an aggressive set of targets and leadership on this to drive the change. And B, from Congress, they need RIF authorities. They need voluntary separation packages, lump sum payment packages that are actually attractive to cause some people to choose early retirement. They need the tools that Congress gave prior secretaries, like Bill Perry, uh, to manage a reshaping of the workforce. You can't reshape the workforce without those tools and authorities. So that's where I would suggest you could really um, help a great deal to lead the charge to give the department the authorities it needs to actually go down this road. Thank you very much. By the way, the, uh, these authorities were taken away really by OPM, again, because of its huge bureaucratic bloat. They're many times larger than they were uh, back in the 80s during the Reagan administration. Many layers were removed, and we had early retirement authority. We had the uh, buyout authority, and we had the RIF authority. Uh, but those have gradually been soaked up by OPM as it has grown like Topsy, uh, even as the defense to, uh, uh, force has shrunk to half its former self. Thank you. As I we said have earlier, OPM is one of the villains in this story. And Congress has not shined enough light on what OPM does and how they do it. We have 10 minutes left. We have two very patient questioners, so I'm going to bundle these, these last two, and then the panelists can take them as they see fit. Sir. My name is uh, Tom Carlogas, taxpayer. Uh, my question is, uh, <laughs> this, I commend the Reagan Library. I commend the panelists. I commend the 
people that have been lured here. That's really a remarkable military industrial complex crowd. But I hear a lot of preaching to the choir. Uh, is there anybody here from the president's cabinet, from the policy making div division at the White House at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to hear these things? Who are, how are we going to get this story from this conference uh, into the guys that make the decisions at OMB, at the cabinet level, at the National Security Council? Uh, how, how can we make these points that I've heard here since 9 o'clock this morning uh, to those guys uh, that make the decisions on these matters? Thank you. And the last question? I'm Joe Nadal. I work for J.P. Morgan, uh, and I cover the aerospace defense industry on Wall Street cover the stocks. Um, I was heartened to hear the question from the congressman uh, before me because mine's really along the same lines, which is that everything that's underlying everything you're saying seems to me to be to have one structural root cause, which is, which is Congress. Congress won't allow these very smart people on both sides of the aisle, um, and speaking of those uh, in particular, uh, uh, the two of you on the left, the three of you on the left of the panel here, uh, you have great ideas, but Congress won't let you implement them, and it's, it's, a, it's a crying shame. So my question really is actually to Senator Sessions. Will you and your, your colleagues enable, g give fast-track authority to these very smart people with great ideas in a, in a bigger way than simply, um, simply uh, personnel, but a more overarching process, including all the overhead issues, including defense industry, rationalization to, uh, to really uh, uh, enable savings. Fast track authority is done with treaties. It's done in other areas. Why can't it be done with this great problem? Well, we can give more flexibility. And I think we should give more flexibility to the Defense Department. I support that. Uh, I don't exactly which one of these people you want to run the world. Uh, I bet if you took them all and gave them an option, they wouldn't all agree. So um, it's hard to get an agreement on all these things. Uh, I don't mean to be partisan at all, but I do think that in the Senate, our Democratic senators have been very loyal to the president. Right now he's saying we're not going to spend more without, uh, we're not, we're not, we want uh, tax increases to fund more spending for the Defense Department. That's a non-starter, it's not in the law. He signed the Budget Control Act. So that's a loggerhead, but I, maybe that's going to break here soon. I hope so. Or maybe members of, of, of the Senate on both sides will reach an agreement to move a little away from that. So I do think the president needs to lead. He's the, normally they do. Uh, he's he's um, put out some good things in his budget, really, that would free up some money. Uh, Mr. Hale, it would uh, deal with some of the entitlements that Congress has mandated that the Defense Department follow for retirees and that kind of thing. Upper income people could pay more uh, on some of that and free up a good bit of money. So we're not where we need to be. I think it's a, a problem across the board. Uh, I'm a little worried about it, frankly. I don't know that we have a clear vision of where we're going, how we're going to get there. Um, both parties have a lot of new members that are tired of being the policemen of the world. And so it's going to take some effort of building an intellectual case to justify that we spend more money on the Defense Department. Uh, and you have to have the vision, the goal that you want to achieve before you ask people to give you more money. So you will have a member of the President's Cabinet here in a few minutes. Uh, Secretary Hagel will be speaking here, and I think many of the ideas that have been discussed here have run up with him. I don't know if you'll find that satisfying. Let me take a great risk and defend the U.S. Congress. used to do this more regularly. I worked for them for 18 years. Um, and, but, but I'll go back to some specific things they have done that haven't been brought out here. We proposed a number of changes in health care. I never imagined they'd approve them. They did. They allowed us to uh, terminate the Uniformed Services Family Health Program, a subsidy to six hospitals, which were devoutly supported, I might add, by their members. They allowed us to use Medicare rates for smaller hospitals, for outpatient care. They allowed us to modestly increase TRICARE fees, first time in 15 years. 
And because of that and a number of other things, for the first time, uh, I think in a long time, we've actually seen health care costs go down slightly in the Department of Defense between fiscal 12 and fiscal 14. So there is some progress made, and I don't want to, although there's a lot more I'd like from Congress, I don't want to demonize them. They have, uh, they are, these are tough votes uh, when you're talking about uh, changing benefits, slowing growth in the middle of a war, and although I'd like more, I think they have done some. What else? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, earlier you asked me how did we get the 600 ship Navy. Um, I had it calculated in the six years I was uh, SecNav, I averaged a third of my time when I was in Washington up on the hill. And uh, you have to sell, you have to sell, you have to sell. And I spent a lot more, a, a lot of time also with the media, with the press, working with them, because you've got to sell your story. That's a great idea. <laughs> you know, it's really, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, some more than others. But uh, uh, the, uh, uh, my experience with Congress is that you, if you can, if you take the time to treat them as equals, and they are an equal branch, like the Constitution or not, the Founding Fathers divided the powers. And a lot of inexperienced people who have been successful in industry or else come to Washington and they think they're in charge in the Pentagon. And why, who should these guys from Alabama, uh, what do they know about it? Well, the fact is they happen to know a hell of a lot most of the time. But you've got to work with them. You've got to spend the time. And my, in my experience, most Pentagons do not spend the time to work with Congress to get their program. You've got to horse trade. You've got to make deals. That's what the process is all about. And uh, uh, so I think Congress gets a bum rap. But where I don't want to let them off too easily is in the 9-11 Commission, we, can't, we urged as one of our top requirements for uh, change to avoid what happened in 9-11 was for Congress to reform the committee systems. I mean, I spent a third of my time up on the Hill every year, but I only had to report really to four committees and subcommittees, two in each house. And today, a, a, a Homeland Security has to report to 120 different subcommittees. The Secretary of the Navy reports to some 60 subcommittees and committees because of, uh, of the proliferation of subcommittees where every, in your second term, you've got to have a, be a chairman of a subcommittee, otherwise you won't get the bundlers to raise the money for your campaign. And Congress has done nothing, Zippo, to reform this chaos in the oversight structure. Right. We're down to the one minute mark, please. Quickly, uh, a Ronald Reagan story about 600 ships. To make a very long story short, I happened to be sitting at the, on, by the wall at a cabinet meeting, and a note was passed to the president that somebody in the Pentagon was challenging 600 ships, 15 aircraft carriers. The president interrupts Gene Kirkpatrick, who's talking about something entirely different, and looks up and says, I understand there are people who oppose 600 ships, 15 carriers. I happen to support it. Does anybody disagree with me? That locked it in. And my point is, ultimately, all the questions we've discussed come down to leadership. Right. Well, I thank all of you in the audience for joining us for this presentation, and a special thanks to our distinguished panel that elevated very important topics.